other people jump on shortly. So uh, as you can see, as well as I, this week's speaker is Corey Simpson, in the Division of Dermatology at the UW, talking about uh, epidermal barrier and blistering diseases from bench to bedside. And again, thank you for reminding us uh, <clears throat> that you were a speaker of the original schedule. I forgot to put you in. So much appreciated that you're up early to give us this talk. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, hopefully my uh, the sun will come up outside my window and you'll be able to see my face a little bit better. It's kind of dark over on my side of town. And so my name is Corey Simpson. I'm a new assistant professor. I've been here about a year and four months over in the Division of Dermatology. And uh, I'm a physician scientist. I spend most of my time in the lab, uh, but then also have a pretty focused clinical practice on a uh, family of diseases called bullets or blistering diseases. And so what I'll do today is try to blend uh, both of my worlds to, um, to tell you what I work on, uh, both at the bench and in the clinic. And um, we'll try to um, highlight some points that I think are important to um, the allergy community as well as the immunology community um, that sort of cross over between dermatology and, um, and your uh, specialty. So um, I think a lot about skin diseases like that shown on the left there, which is a form of ichthyosis, which is a really dry, scaly skin condition where the skin barrier is not formed correctly. And in my lab, we're really trying to understand how do these diseases um, manifest at the level of tissues, organelles, and then single organelles. And in fact, we're using live imaging, uh, like shown in this video here, to try to understand biology as it's happening in live tissues. And so really, we're hoping to take these basic science um, findings and really translate them back to some of these rare disorders of the skin, um, which really lack effective treatments. So I see a number of rare diseases in my clinic that really don't have great um, treatment options just yet. Um, as disclosures for CME, uh, my uh, wife works for United Health Group, uh, has stock options there. I've done some consulting for Argenix, which has a treatment uh, that is investigating for a blistering disease. Um, and I will discuss off-label therapies because there's almost nothing on-label for most of the diseases that, that I treat. Um, so I give a little background about myself. Um, I got interested in blistering diseases because I did a PhD at Northwestern um, where I worked with Kathy Green, who is a really great basic scientist who um, helped to elucidate the functions of this structure here, which if you remember back to your medical school histology days, um, this is a desmosome. And desmosomes are really important for holding cells together in tissues that endure mechanical stress like the skin and the heart and the hair. And so this is what a desmosome looks like on light microscopy fluorescent space. So these are the little desmosomes, these tiny little uh, yellow, um, let me get the pointer up here. These tiny little yellow dots that are connecting the bones of the cells, the cytoskeleton, which is made out of keratin, kind of staples those bones together between cells and really allows them to resist mechanical stress. And if you blow these up, they're made up of a whole bunch of different proteins, which I studied during my PhD. But the important thing is that if you um, remove the function of these proteins, either through genetic mutations or through the formation of autoantibodies in certain autoimmune diseases, um, you get a disease called pemphigus, where the skin basically, the whole barrier blisters off because the, the skin cells are no longer able to hold on to one another. So this can affect mucous membranes and it can affect the skin and really causes a pretty devastating and potentially fatal disorder. So this is what got me interested in dermatology. The molecules I was studying at the bench could actually have um, a direct clinical implication for patients who had these diseases. Um, so I went to Penn for a training in dermatology, did my residency there and had two wonderful mentors who were also physician scientists and they taught me how to care for patients with blistering diseases. And they also ran laboratories, which was um, pretty inspiring to me as a young physician scientist. And then when I was at Penn, I started to focus a little bit more on genetic causes of blistering diseases where the skin barrier breaks down, not because of autoantibodies, but due to mutations that affect the way that these skin cells hold on to one another. So these are two diseases called Derrier and haley haley disease, which um, have become part of my specialty clinic up at the Roosevelt Clinic. <clears throat> so this is my lab now at the South Lake Union campus. So we have a really nice lab space and I'm building, slowly building a lab. We are recruiting a postdoc still. So if you know somebody who's interested in postdoctoral research, please um, have them reach out to me. And um, this is our fancy microscope. This is a confocal microscope that we do all of our live imaging and tissues on. And I'll, I'll show you some, some images from that a little bit later. So the overview of my talk is really to talk a little bit about genetic blistering diseases and how we use uh, models in the lab to model some of these barrier disorders of the epidermis. So we use a tool called gene editing and keratinocytes, which I'll explain, and thinking about using these organoid skin models to really screen for drugs that could help in some of these rare uh, skin diseases. <clears throat> 
And then I'll switch, switch gears to talk about what I see more commonly in the clinic, which are autoimmune blistering diseases. And I'll talk about a disease called bullous pemphigoid, which I think has quite a bit of overlap with, um, with some of your clinical specialty, um, being that it, it presents often with urticarial morphology. It has a lot of type 2 inflammation in it, eosinophils. And then um, we'll go through some of the biologic therapies that are in the pipelines um, that are really based on some of the basic biology that's been worked out um, in these disorders. So I always like to start as a scientist about emphasizing that, you know, even as a clinician, I still have to appreciate the importance of basic science. And there was an interesting article in the Washington Post by Bill Kalin, who was a Nobel laureate, um, uh, called Why We Can't Cure Cancer with the Moonshot. And, um, but I thought there were some interesting quotes. And one was that now is not the time to abandon basic science in the false hope that we already know enough to eliminate the pain and suffering caused by complex diseases. And I think that's true. They also said that the most important scientific discoveries often began with an unexpected experimental result that a scientist then pursued. And I think this is often the case. Much of science comes from an interesting story where a scientist just was curious about something and stumbled upon some finding that actually revolutionized the way that we do research. One of those is a protein showed here called green fluorescent protein. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a very important protein um, for modern biology. It glows in the dark. It's what allows jellyfish to actually glow in the dark. And this came out of a scientist who was just curious as to why do uh, jellyfish glow in the dark. And so he had this quote saying, I discovered the green um, fluorescent protein <clears throat> from the jellyfish in 1961. It was a beautiful protein, but it remained essentially useless for the next 30 years. Uh, but this little protein here has allowed us to basically um, color biology to allow us to observe it um, in real time. So we can mark molecules with these fluorescent proteins and sort of color code them with any variety of these shades shown here. And that allows us to watch um, biology as it happens in real time. And we can even do in vivo modeling where you have here some green fluorescent mice, for example. Um, so that allowed me to do a postdoc about live imaging and to learn how to do this sort of thing in the lab. And I work with a wonderful mentor named Erica Holzbauer whose lab was based on um, trying to understand neurodegenerative diseases by using live imaging approaches. And instead of imaging neurons like this, I basically switched in my own favorite tissue, which is the epidermis, and used their tools and expertise to understand how can we image the epidermis as it's forming to better understand its bio uh, biological mechanisms of how the skin forms a barrier, which is really what protects us from the outside world, prevents pathogens from getting in, prevents allergens from getting in, et cetera. So this is an example of what you can do with the power of live imaging. These are, this is a keratinocyte, which is a skin cell. And you can see this is actin in green cycling around the cell and moving its mitochondria around. So you can really watch biology with a high level of precision um, and brightness actually. So this is the epidermis, which is my favorite tissue. Um, it's made out of keratinocytes. It's a stratified epithelium that sits at the barrier of our body. So this is the part of the, of the tissue that you can actually touch with your hand. And keratinocytes are all these purple cells here that undergo a unique process of uh, differentiation. So they move outward as they differentiate. And at the very end of their lifespan, they have to do a really unique form of uh, terminal differentiation called cornification. And during this process, they break down their nuclei <clears throat> and they break down all of their organelles. And that's what allows them to form these sort of dead pink layers, um, which really staple together and form um, pretty, you know, an impermeable barrier for the body. And we know that this process gets disrupted um, in disorders of cornification, as shown here. So there are a number of different disorders that disrupt the skin barrier, shown here, some examples. And so um, we wonder, well, does, you know, how does this process actually occur um, in the epidermis? Can we elucidate the mechanisms of this to potentially strengthen the epidermal barrier to prevent invasion by pathogens or allergens and to potentially treat some of these disorders that we really don't have good therapies for? So our hypothesis has been that there's a biological process called autophagy, which I'll explain in a minute. And that might be what's responsible for allowing these keratinocytes at the end of their lifespan to really wholesale degrade all of their organelles and their nuclei in order to form a tightly sealed um, skin barrier. So we started by looking at um, uh, uh, the pathway that's called autophagy, which I'll explain here. So this is a, an image of a mitochondrion. And so autophagy starts with an initiation signal that tells the cell that this organelle needs to be gotten rid of. And so that activates a family of proteins called autophagy receptors. These mark the surface of that organelle and sort of serve like a recycling symbol that lets you know that something can be sent to the recycling factory. And then there's another protein that's called LC3 that actually kind of puts this thing in a hefty bag or in a recycling bin essentially, and sort of forms a second membrane around it so that the cell kind of cordons off this organelle that it needs to get rid of. And then finally it merges with a lysosome, which is kind of the garbage disposal of the cell or, or the recycling factory of the cell. And that degrades the organelle. And so this is like taking that stuff in the recycling bin 
and actually taking it to the recycling factory. So this is how the cell can get rid of its organelles by kind of routing them into this degradative compartment that ends at the lysosome and kind of breaks down those organelles, um, which is what it really needs to do in a tissue like the skin. It's kind of like what a red blood cell does as it goes from being an erythroblast, it eventually becomes a mature red blood cell, which doesn't have nuclei um, or organelles. So scientifically we asked, well, how can we study this process of organelle degradation in the epidermis as a tissue? Could we do this in a live context where the cells are actually still alive and moving around? And could we do this within a 3D tissue model? And we started with looking at mitochondria, which are um, sort of a really important organelle in the cell that does a lot of things like coordinate things like cell death, calcium homeostasis, energy production, oxidative stress, things like this. And so I'll just show you briefly what we use in the lab to model the epidermis. This is called a raft culture where we essentially create a, a, a skin culture in, vi, uh, in vitro, so we can do it in the lab, where we use collagen and fibroblasts to make kind of a raft to float these cells on. We seed keratinocytes from human patients on top of them as a confluent monolayer of cells. And then actually, if we remove the liquid medium and only feed them from the bottom so that their top surface is exposed to the air, these cells actually grow and stratify to form a fully cornified epithelium that is the epidermis. So if we look at these in culture, this is what they look like. They're sort of sitting inside of a little well here. And if we take an H&E image of a cross-section of this tissue, this is what it looks like. So we have basal layers, all these intermediate layers, cornified layers up here that have lost their organelles and nuclei, suggesting that we can essentially recreate the skin as an organoid um, right in the laboratory, which allows us a pretty powerful approach to model um, this barrier formation as it's happening um, in a model of the skin tissue. So we can observe this tissue with a microscope live. So instead of looking at it in a fixed manner, we can actually watch things like how the organelles are, are moving around and um, you know, undergoing fission and fusion. These are mitochondria here. You can see that the skin isn't sort of just sitting around. As we're all sitting here, our skin is actually moving and changing its organelle structure um, while we're sitting here. So we can use this technique to mark any different organelle compartment in the skin and basically watch how it affects, <clears throat> you know, how it gets degraded over time, essentially. We can look at ER or mitochondria, peroxisomes. We could look at things like secretory granules, these kinds of things that can be involved in allergic diseases as well, if you think about more um, uh, inflammatory cells. So the other thing we can do is take this organoid model and, and combine it with a new technique that I'll talk to you about called CRISPR-Cas9, which I hope you've heard a little bit about. And this allows us to basically genetically modify these pieces of skin so that we can model some of these genetic disorders that go around in the clinic and really don't have good, um, good treatments. So if we know the gene that's involved in the disorder, take something like Netherton's disease, which can have sort of a, a uh, you know, a crossover between atopic disease as well as skin barrier dysfunction. So something like that is known to be linked to a single gene. So we can use a technology called CRISPR to model that gene, uh, to model that uh, gene dysfunction in the lab and allow us to understand um, better how that disease happens at a, at a cellular level. And this can also be used to screen new treatments. And you can imagine that using an organoid small piece of skin in the lab is probably a lot more efficient if you want to try out kind of new drugs rather than marching them right over the clinic and putting them into a patient. So this can actually be kind of a preclinical model to look for new treatments for rare disorders, which has been the focus of my lab. Um, so if we use an inhibitor of this garbage disposal pathway in the cells uh, against autophagy, this is a chemical inhibitor, we can then look at how, these, um, how the morphology of these epidermal culture turns out. And you can see if we have a control culture on the left, you see that the barrier forms normally have these granular layers here, which form the dead layers, the cornified layers normally. But if we use this inhibitor of the autophagy pathway, now we get retention of nuclei in those upper layers. So the cells aren't really going through that barrier formation prop, uh, process properly. And they also accumulate these large vacuoles, suggesting that their garbage disposal mechanism is kind of getting uh, clogged up. Moreover, if we look at their ability to form a barrier, and this protein is actually quite important for allergic diseases, it's called filaggrin. It's a risk factor gene for atopic disease, um, as well as I believe asthma in the sort of atopic march of disease, allergies, et cetera. Filaggrin helps these cells to basically form the barrier as they transition into those upper layers. So if we block this degradative pathway that you know, sort of allows keratinocytes to get rid of their organelles. If we put a stop to that with a chemical inhibitor, these cells no longer express this filaggrin protein, which indicates that that's a really important pathway for the epidermis to generate the proper barrier to allow us to exclude pathogens and allergens from the ex uh, external world from getting deeper into the skin where they can really cause problems. <clears throat> so um, keratinocytes in the upper layers undergo this process of differentiation and they get rid of their organelles. So we can watch this process live by using a, a fluorescent marker that's based on that GFP protein to actually mark the, um, the organelles in a fluorescent color. So shown here are mitochondria that are marked red. And what you see is in the lower layers, <clears throat> sorry, 
In the lower layers, they have this sort of tubular bean-like structure, which is what you learn in, in uh, sort of high school about what organelles look like. But in the upper layers, they get all chopped up into these fragments. And so um, we ended up having a paper trying to understand whether these organelles get routed into that garbage disposal of the cell, which is the autophagy pathway or the lysosome. And so I'll just sort of give you the upshot of that is that we found this um, recycling symbol called Nix, which is actually involved in the maturation of red blood cells. Like I mentioned before, they also have to get rid of their nuclei and organelles as they mature. So this ends up being the signal that tells the cell, it sort of plugs it into the um, mitochondria membrane and tells the cell to get rid of it, just like a red blood cell would get rid of its organelles. We think it's using the same pathway in a keratinocyte to tell those cells to get rid of their mitochondria. So kind of the upshot of that story, which we, um, this is my postdoctoral work, was that in the upper layers of the epidermis, as these keratinocytes are forming that barrier, which is really essential to prevent things from getting inside of the, of the uh, body that really shouldn't, um, they express this recycling symbol called Nix, which localizes to their mitochondria. This seems to be driven by a hypoxia pathway, which I didn't go into the detail here. But this allows them to basically chop up their mitochondria into bite-sized bits that then allow them to get um, cleaved up into these bite-sized fragments that can then be routed into the garbage disposal of the cell, um, which is the lysosome. And that process is actually really important for telling the cells when it's time for them to get rid of their organelles in this process called cornification, where they sort of transition from these flattened live cells into these dead cell layers, which are absolutely critical for our bodies to form um, a, a sort of watertight seal around our bodies, again, to prevent allergens and other um, uh, you know, noxious stimuli from getting inside of the body. So going from there, we were trying to ask in my lab, well, do keratinocytes have sort of a code for other organelles? Do they have other autophagy receptors or these recycling symbols that tell them to get rid of their, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, their peroxisomes or other sort of structures? Is there kind of a playbook that lets them know what's next in the sequence of events of getting rid of their organelles? And so that's what my lab is partially working on now. Um, the other thing I wanted to emphasize about going back to that concept of that basic science is really important. We call it basic science, which is sort of a misnomer. It can get pretty complicated at times. We, we probably ought to call it more fundamental science, understanding fundamental biology and how it can actually inform our understanding of biology as itself or biology as it gets disrupted in human diseases. So um, I want to emphasize this pathway here, which, which plays into the next part of my talk. So CRISPR-Cas9, if you haven't heard of it, is a really important emerging tool um, it stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, which is why nobody ever says that they say CRISPR. But these are short DNA sequences that are commonly found in viruses that have infected bacteria in the past. And so there was actually an evolved mechanism for organisms to recognize these pieces of DNA um, as sort of a defense against viruses. And so um, it has this sort of DNA sequence that it recognizes, and then there's this enzyme called Cas9, and that recognizes these sequences and then cuts the DNA at those sites. So it was originally used to find and destroy foreign DNA and keeping, uh, keep it uh, basically as a defense mechanism against an invading pathogen. Um, so the natural system, though, can be engineered to inactivate a gene, to test its function in the lab, to edit DNA, to insert a known mutation. If you want to model a specific disease, you can sort of go in with a corrective tool and basically change one base pair that models a patient that you might have in the clinic who has a rare genetic disorder. Or thinking about therapeutically, you could actually use this technique to correct mutated DNA to potentially cure a genetic disease. So people are exploring this um, for diseases that are linked to a specific gene mutation so that these um, types of gene uh, editing techniques could be used in a patient to actually correct um, a gene mutation, sort of allow people with genetic diseases to actually have hope that there could be a cure for their disorder. Um, but I want to emphasize that this came out of um, scientists who were just curious about how do bacteria sort of have defense mechanisms against viruses, and it was very basic biology, but it's really revolutionized what's possible in both genetic modeling in the lab setting, but also what's potentially feasible in a clinical setting. You know, we've been telling genetic patients for years, those with genetic disorders, that there's really whole, not a whole lot for them. Um, for most diseases, there aren't really genetic specific, um, specific treatments. And we sort of tell them a lot of times it's more supportive care and screening and things. But this actually changes that, that paradigm. It might actually allow us to really go in and fix the genetic mutation that's responsible for a patient's disease. And so this was a, um, a landmark discovery by these two scientists, Dr. Charpentier and Dr. Doudna, who won the Nobel Prize in 2020 for um, having discovered this technique, which is now potentially of important clinical relevance. So we can now use this editing technique to model certain disorders of the epidermis um, in the lab. So I see patients with this disorder here, which is called Derrier disease. 
Um, this is what it looks like pathologically, where you sort of get this split in the epidermis, so their barrier is disrupted, and they can get skin infections and things quite frequently because their, their epidermis isn't really tightly sealed. And we've known for about 20 years that this little gene here called CIRCA2, which is a calcium pump that sits in the ER, that that's responsible for this disease. But, you know, that was discovered 20 years ago, and yet there hasn't really been any treatment advance for this particular disorder. So it's pretty frustrating when I see patients in my clinic um, who have widespread skin barrier disruption. And I have to tell them that there's really not any specific therapy for them, but we're hoping to change that. One of the problems is that if you try to knock out this gene in a mouse, it does not replicate the human disease, which is which is you know sort of a major limitation because that's how a lot of preclinical testing gets done is in mouse models, but that doesn't work for dairy disease. Um, so again, we can use CRISPR-Cas9, this sort of gene editing approach to actually remove a base pair within this gene and then essentially have a model for this disorder in the lab. So I can make keratinocyte skin cells that lack this gene, and then that allows us to essentially have the same genetic background um, as a patient that I'm seeing in the clinic. So that's a really powerful approach to allow us to screen for new treatments. And I'll just give you a quick example of how we do that. So these are skin cells here, just as a schematic, with their little nuclei, and they're all adhesive together. They're sticking together as a sheet of cells. And um, this is what that looks like in the lab. So we can lift up a whole sheet of keratinocytes, um, and then we can subject them to mechanical stress and see whether the sheet breaks up. And this assesses whether those cells are really holding on to one another strongly. So if we treat the cells with a control drug here, you can see that the sheet breaks up into a bunch of pieces, but then we can use these sheets as sort of a screening mechanism to allow us to identify drugs that would help to keep the barrier back together. So look for drugs that could potentially reverse that phenomenon. And that's what we see here is that we found a couple of drugs that can actually help these sheets to stick together more effectively. And you can imagine that you know, putting these on the skin could actually be quite an effective um, uh, therapeutic avenue because this can actually help potentially help the tissue to maintain its integrity so that you don't get this loss of the barrier of the epidermis so that these allergens and pathogens and other things don't have a chance to get inside of the skin where they shouldn't be. And so we've been able to identify a couple of different compounds that really can significantly reduce the fragmentation of these keratinocytes to keep them from breaking up essentially. So the summary for part one of the talk, which I hope I didn't um, lose too many people who are more clinically oriented, but this is the basic science that I think is really important. And I hope I've convinced you that fundamental science is actually absolutely, absolutely critical to modeling certain rare diseases in the lab and to um, basically identify new um, therapeutic approaches for diseases for which we really don't have good therapies. So by using live microscopy through the power of GFP, which is out of a basic science um, curiosity, um, this allows us to reveal the mechanisms of how the skin barrier forms. And so we can try to understand whether these organelle degradation pathways that we've identified in my lab might be compromised in diseases that you might see in clinics such as atopic dermatitis, asthma, eosinophilic esophagitis. We think of all of these um, diseases as being partially a problem with the immune system, but also potentially starting as a problem with the actual barrier tissue itself being leaky and allowing things to get through that really shouldn't. And so could understanding how cells actually form these barrier tissues through fundamental biological investigations, could we identify new pathways that might actually be effective um, for targeting therapeutically in diseases like these? Um, so could there be an alternative um, rather than sort of um, having to shut down some part of someone's immune system through steroids or other sort of targeted biologics like dupilumab, which is now widely used, could we have more of a targeted therapeutic approach to actually attack some of these cell biological pathways to actually restore the barrier instead of having to tar target the immune system itself? So could something like autophagy be targeted in some of these diseases? And then I hope that I've also convinced you that gene editing through CRISPR-Cas9 is a really important technology that allows us to model genetic diseases in vitro. So we can now model these diseases in the lab to hopefully find better cures. Um, this is especially important when mouse models fail to phenocopy what happens in human pathologies. And we're hopeful that this type of an approach may actually reveal new treatments for some of these orphan um, epidermal barrier disorders that I see in my clinic that has been you know, very frustrating to not see the kind of therapeutic advances for those rare diseases, like we've seen on the other side with more common inflammatory diseases like asthma, atopic dermatitis, things like that. We've seen pretty significant advances in the bio, biological therapy. So we're hoping that this can help to um, bring some of the new biology into the field of rare diseases to treat some patients with some rarer uh, causes of the genetic diseases. Um, I'm going to move on to part two, which is a, more of a case-based presentation. It'll be much more clinical, um, but I wanted to take a break here and ask if there are any questions about the first part of the talk, which is more focused on basic science mechanisms and, and uh, my laboratory set, uh, focus.
All right, if you come up with other questions, please um, feel free to let me know. So part two is more of a clinical case that I hope highlights some of the crossover um, between dermatology and um, allergy immunology. Um, so this is a case of a 68-year-old woman, and this is a typical example of what I'll see um, in my clinic, which focuses mostly on blistering disorders, which are usually autoimmune, but blistering disorders that can also be genetic, like what I was talking about in the last section. So this is a 68-year-old woman who came to the ER at UWMC, um, who complained of recurrent hives on the trunk and the extremities for about two years. Um, they were intensely itchy, um, didn't notice any blistering, had no mucosal erosions. Um, it seemed to flare after she got vaccinated by, for COVID-19, which I've had a lot of patients sort of complain about, whether that's causal or just sort of coincidental is still to be determined. And she hadn't started any new medications or herbals and hadn't had any, any new contactants to the skin that might've caused some irritation or allergy. So this is what it looked like here. Um, you can see the arm here with these urticarial plaques, which are you know, raised, very red, and um, palpable um, um, from the skin. And this is a, sort of more of a typical urticarial morphology. So these look like what people normally refer to as hives. Um, so these are pretty typical, but this has been going on for two years in a 68-year-old, which is a little bit odd, I would say, and really didn't have to, uh, happen to have any particular trigger that she could identify. She didn't really have much as far as past medical history. She had some low, uh, low bone density, um, anxiety, and then had this rare form of a, of a thickening of her palms and soles, which was interesting to me as a genetic dermatologist, but I don't think it really probably impacts on the case. Her medications include escitalopram for anxiety as well as hydrochlorothiazide. Um, she was allergic, uh, per her history, as uh, to sulfa drugs, cats, as well as dust mites. Her family history, there was no blistering disease or other kind of autoimmune diseases. Her paternal side of the family had this sort of rare inherited thickening of the palms and soles, but no other diseases that ran in the family. And she didn't report any uh, exotic travel or other environmental exposures prior to this rash I'm developing. So I imagine if you see patients in the allergy immunology clinic, you probably get people like this every once in a while who have um, recurrent hives that they really can't seem to get controlled. And I imagine they might look something uh, like this. And so um, in our world, we would just call this sort of urticaria until proven otherwise. But the atypical things here is that this has been going on for two years. And I'll also tell you that the lesions last longer than um, 24 hours. So typically we think about urticarial lesions really kind of flaring up and then moving on by the next day and not really staying fixed in the same place. So that's a little bit atypical in this case too. Here's some other images of the, kind of the extent of her disease. So she had urticarial plaques on the back as well. You can see on the lower back side, a lot of these smaller papules, some larger plaques on the upper back. Um, and this is sort of a pretty classic um, lesion here. We can kind of almost see this rim of erythema around it. Um, and this sort of uh, bright pink uh, center to it, which is raised and palpable. And this is a pretty typical kind of hive-like lesion or urticarial um, uh, plaque. <clears throat> so um, what had been done in this case is that um, she had gotten treatment by her primary care physician, which is common, and they had used what are all the normal good therapies. So she was on a, a boatload of antihistamines as far as I'm used to prescribing. So um, she was on loratadine, 40 milligrams a day. She was taking cetirizine 40 milligrams at night, as well as taking 50 milligrams of hydroxyzine three times a day. So usually people come in and they say they have resistant hives and we ask them what they've tried. And usually they've tried maybe 10 or 20 milligrams of, of uh, loratadine. And we say, well, that's not really a sufficient trial of you know, um, full dose antihistamines. We can't really say it's resistant to antihistamines until you've really tried a, a bigger dose. And But this lady, I would say, you know, at 40, of, 40 and 40 of, um, uh, two uh, more targeted antihistamines and then 50 of hydroxyzine, that's a, that's a pretty good dose of antihistamines. And she still wasn't actually getting full relief. This was helping, but not really giving her um, entire relief. So she was still getting hives despite this. Um, she was using clobetasol as a class one topical steroid twice a day on the lesions and was getting repeated two week courses of prednisone, which would you know improve her rash, but then it would flare after she tapered it. And that's that's also a pretty, you know, risk, a risky type of a practice. She already has osteoporosis, so this is not a great thing to do in patients, but in patients who are just absolutely miserable, sometimes we resort to these um, courses of prednisone to give them um, some relief. As I mentioned, something atypical in this case was that the lesions lasted weeks in each spot, so they weren't really having that typical kind of urticarial um, brief duration of less than 24 hours. And as I mentioned, it didn't resolve with the, despite these high doses of antihistamine. Um, the lesions did leave behind some hyperpigmentation. So that's something that's often kind of more of a warning sign in dermatology. If we feel like the lesions are a little more inflammatory and maybe moving toward more urticarial vasculitis, for example, they might leave behind sort of a footprint from where the spots were before. 
but she didn't have any symptoms that sounded like vasculitis, like fever, joint pain, oral erosions, any GI issues or focal neurological complaints. Um, so after two years of having hives that really weren't responding to normal treatment, um, then she started developing blistering lesions on top of the hives. So these were fluid filled or tense belay that developed right on top of the hive like lesions. And she also started to develop um, sores inside of her mouth. So this is when she got referred over um, to dermatology and had a diagnostic skin biopsy, which I'm showing you. This is not her biopsy, but a very typical biopsy um, shown here. So this is a very typical biopsy for this disorder. And so what you can see is that the entire epidermis here has peeled off of the underlying epidermis. So that's what we call a subepidermal blister. And what you can see is that in the blister cavity, there's a ton of these cells that are really brightly pink, and those are eosinophils. And so that's a very typical um, uh, histologic finding for this particular disease. Um, the other part of this diagnosis requires immunofluorescence. So this is a direct immunofluorescence, a tissue that's taken from nearby to one of these lesions. And what you can see is that there's this green fluorescence right along the basement membrane zone. And this is IgG that deposits there along the basement membrane zone. And that's essentially diagnostic. These two um, pictures together are essentially diagnostic for a disease called bolus pemphigoid. And so I'll tell you a little bit about bolus pemphigoid as sort of a review of it clinically, where it might cross over with what you see in the allergy immunology types of clinics where people come in with chronic urticaria. Um, but this is what it can look like. Um, often, it, it, you know, classically, it sort of presents with these urticarial plaques that are studded with blisters that have fluid in them. Um, it's something important that we're learning in dermatology is that it's really essential as we teach um, other people about these diseases that we show a variety of skin tones because different um, rashes can actually look quite a bit different depending on the level of background pigmentation that the patient has. So this is a patient of mine um, from when I was in Philadelphia at Penn. I saw this patient who had classic bullous pemphigoid. But what you can see here is that she has a really classic tense bulla, but you can't really appreciate the erythema. But when we biopsied the eyes of this lesion, it had just as many eosinophils and inflammatory cells as did this patient of mine. So even though we can't see it with the eye always, we have to be on the lookout for other markers of, of disease in patients that may not present with the classical kind of erythema. If you look up this to, uh, you know, textbook sort of images, almost all the images you find in image banks are really highly skewed towards um, background type one or Caucasian skin like this here. Um, and that's pretty disturbing because it shapes and really biases what learners are picturing skin diseases to look like and that they may not recognize it if we show it always in this skin tone. So it's really important to display the, the whole variety of what skin disease can look like, um, regardless you know, sort of, um, of the background skin pigmentation type. So these are several different patients with different background pigmentation. You can see that the erythema and all, also the hyperpigmentation that occurs in darker skin tones um, can be much more prominent than you might see in someone with a lighter base skin tone. So this is something that we actually published a case series about because it's important, especially in rare diseases, to increase the variety of skin tones that we have available for learners in the sort of um, image banks that we use to teach patients, uh, to teach um, residents and fellows and students about these disorders. Um, so this is the uh, bolus pemphigoid can also look like this. So oftentimes those blisters won't stay intact. You can actually just have a patient coming in with erosions because those blisters have essentially popped. Um, the other thing to notice from this image is that if you do have a patient with a darker skin tone, um, oftentimes the dispigmentation from these disorders can be quite devastating. So even though this patient was getting better in that her erosions were healing up, she was really disturbed by the dispigmentation that occurs. So all these little dots of pigmentation or re-emergence of melanocytes um, coming out of hair follicles to repopulate the epidermis. And so that can actually be very um, uh, disturbing to patients and can actually be quite disfiguring. Um, even as their skin is healing, um, there can still be footprints of this left behind um, for months to years because of the, the damage to the pigmentation from the inflammation. <clears throat> so this is the image that I wanted to show your audience because these are, you know, are pretty typical lesions that I think most of us would call urticaria. Um, <clears throat> so raised, you know, sort of wheels, et cetera, that are really sort of palpable and very itchy and sort of have this typical urticarial morphology. But all three of these patients uh, ended up having bolus pemphigoid. So that really can look clinically quite similar um, to regular old urticaria. So these were um, a couple of different patients that I think are important to show that, you know, these patients came in with a diagnosis of just resistant urticaria, but ended up having um, a true diagnosis of bolus pemphigoid. Bolus pemphigoid can also affect the mucous membrane. So if a patient starts to develop oral erosions in the mouth or other mucosal surfaces, of course, that wouldn't be typical for urticaria. So that should be another clue. In this case, the patient started developing blisters, but then also had erosions in her mouth. So that was another clue that this wasn't just garden variety um, urticaria. Corey, can I just ask you a question? Absolutely. Yeah, why did it take two years for the manifestation of 
of the disease to change? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think probably the autoantibody profile may evolve over time. I don't have that evidence, you know, in this particular patient, but we think probably, you know, as I'll show you in a minute, the, the pathophysiology of this disease is because patients develop autoantibodies against the basement membrane zone, and that recruits in a bunch of different inflammatory cells. So it may be sort of a gradually evolving process, but there are some people that never develop blisters. They just have an urticarial form of bullous pemphigoid. And whether it's a different um, formation of uh, deposition of certain IgG versus IgE versus um, whether they can deposit complement at the basement membrane zone may determine whether they form frank blisters or not. But truthfully, we, we don't know. The, the specific inflammatory cells that get recruited are supposedly responsible for secreting proteases and things that actually degrade the basement membrane zone, and that that might contribute to the actual formation of proper blisters. But we really don't know why some patients can have this sort of urticarial form of this disease for a long time without um, uh, evolving into proper blisters. The other um, possibility is that maybe she did have a you know normal urticaria in the beginning, but because of the repeated insult and inflammation at her basement membrane zone and having some genetic susceptibility to an autoimmune uh, sort of risk, maybe then she developed those autoantibodies sort of later in that course. So we think about some of these skin autoinflammatory disorders or <clears throat> autoimmune disorders as potentially being originally driven by a potentially an infectious exposure or other kind of inflammatory damage to tissues that actually then um, result in more of a, a type 2 um, um, autoantibody reaction with, with antibodies arising against those tissues, but we're not totally sure about that. <clears throat> um, it, pemphigoid is also a rare disease, so most people who come in with urticaria are going to have urticaria. That's much more common than pemphigoid. This affects about one in 8,300 adults in the U.S. It's way more common with increasing age. So if you have an 80 or 90 year old coming in with new onset urticaria, I would be much more, more worried about them having bullous pemphigoid than somebody in a younger age group. So you can see here on the right, you know, it's maybe a hot, one in 100,000 in the kind of people in their 20s versus, you know, it's not that uncommon, one in 800 once you hit the, the 90 year old threshold. So I see a lot of patients in my clinic that end up being in their 90s and are just completely miserable from this disease because they're incredibly itchy and they're covered in blisters. Um, the other risk factors that have been identified, it seems to track with um, neurological diseases, with Parkinson in particular, and we don't understand exactly why that is. Um, there is a form of this antigen that's targeted in this autoimmune disease that act is actually found in neurons, so there may be some immunologic crossover, although we thought that the, the blood-brain barrier ought to prevent that kind of thing. But um, anyway, it's also been linked to certain medications. So if you have patients that have started new medications and then develop hives, we all know that that's a, a potential trigger for, um, for urticaria. But in particular with bullous pemphigoid, um, DPP-4 inhibitors, which are now very commonly uh, prescribed for diabetes, so these are the ones that uh, end in gliptins, those have been linked to the development of bullous pemphigoid, and we don't understand exactly why, but there have been enough sort of larger scale retrospective studies like this one, which is a meta-analysis of 138 randomized controlled trials that identified a number of patients, you know, th tens of thousands of patients on these inhibitors, um, and identified that they had um, quite a few more cases of bullous pemphigoid in the treatment group than in the control group. A low prevalence overall in these groups, but still an increased odds ratio that was statistically significant, suggesting that these um, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors may actually be um, potentially uh, causative or able to unmask this type of an autoimmunity in certain susceptible patients. <clears throat> the differential diagnosis in this case is pretty broad. There are a bunch of different autoimmune blistering diseases, which I don't expect all of you to, to know about, but these are um, derm dermatologic diseases that we always keep in the back of our minds, although they're, they're all relatively uncommon. But bullous pemphigoid is the most common of these. There's a whole bunch of other ones that can sort of mimic one another and form blisters. Um, but there are things that are way more common than bullous pemphigoid that ought to be in the differential diagnosis if someone comes in with hive-like lesions that also have blisters. So contact dermatitis can cause a very similar picture. So if someone's putting something new onto their skin, um, that can actually cause an acute inflammatory reaction and cause something that looks like bullous pemphigoid with blisters and hive-like lesions. Arthropod bites, I've had quite a few patients that come in in the summertime, especially with mostly these large urticarial plaques and, and nodules and then blisters on top of them, mostly on their legs if they've been outside or have been exposed to, um, to bugs at some, at some level. So certain patients are just susceptible to get these extremely inflammatory reactions with a ton of eosinophils that come into the skin in response to um, insect bites and then can develop lesions just like this. But there are also a few infectious etiologies such as bullous tinea. So a fungal infection can actually cause blisters on the skin that can be pretty itchy just like this. Erythema multiforme is a, a less common, but 
um, can also cause um, a blistering like this. Um, and it's thought to be a reaction to certain infections like herpes simplex virus, and then scabies, which is a really common <clears throat> um, uh, itchy parasite that can get onto the skin that can actually form histology that looks exactly like Boas pemphigoid. So we often treat patients who are older and live in um, more communal environments like a nursing home where there are outbreaks of scabies pretty frequently. Um, we will often treat them for scabies, hoping that it's a more simpler etiology to treat. We can cure scabies. We can't yet cure something like Boas pemphigoid. But they're often very difficult to tell apart from one another, both clinically and histologically. Um, and then also, if you're dealing with an older population that, that has a caregiver, um, you have to think about non-accidental trauma where you see blisters that sort of have an odd etiology. You can get scalding injuries and stuff that can look um, quite a bit like these blistering um, lesions. So these are three different patients that came into my clinic that were all referred in for bullous pemphigoid, but actually had something different. So on the left there, this was a florid fungal infection. So this is a patient who was on immunosuppression, thought he was flaring with his bullous pemphigoid because he was very itchy and had rash. You can kind of see there aren't typical blisters. These are more annular-like lesions. And so we scraped this and it had a bunch of fungus on it. So of course, the treatment of that is very different than somebody who has true uh, bullous pemphigoid flare. Scabies, this patient was also referred in, but you can see that her lesions are much smaller, but she was incredibly itchy. And um, this was an easy one to treat because giving a course of ivermectin or topical permethrin can really cure this disease. And it was nice to be able to tell her she did not have bullous pemphigoid. And then this is an example of a patient who might come in with those insect bites on the lower legs that can look very much like bullous pemphigoid, but um, really shouldn't have positive immunologic testing, which I'll go through in just a minute here. So the diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid um, usually requires a skin biopsy and at least one immunologic test. Because there are multiple etiologies that can have similar biopsy findings, you really need something to tell you that it's truly an autoimmune disease. Um, so that can be immunofluorescence, either direct or indirect, or an ELISA test. So we actually have an ELISA test that, that specifically quantifies bullous pemphigoid-specific antibodies. So just a little bit about um, biopsies, how we do these. So we do an H&E biopsy, which allows us to see where the blister occurs and what kind of inflammatory cells are in the mix. And we take that from the edge of a blister, and that allows us to see you know, whether there are a ton of eosinophils that have come into the skin to cause this type of a disease. And then we take a second biopsy sort of nearby to a blister, but a little ways away. And that allows us to see where the antibodies have actually been deposited in the skin. So this is how pemphigus occurs. Over on the left is a diagram of the epidermis. The epidermal keratinocytes sit on top of a basement membrane, which then gets adhered down to the dermis by collagen, and then fat is below that. So these are the two keratinocytes sort of being stapled down to this basement membrane by these adhesive Velcro-like molecules. So I think of the basement membrane zone as like a as an hemidesmosome, which basically sticks the basement uh, the basal layer of keratinocytes down to the basement membrane. Sort of think of it like um, Velcro, where you have these hooks, which are the hemidesmosomes that loop into these loops of laminin and other components of the basement membrane that basically um, attach that layer of keratinocytes and hold the whole epidermis down to the basement membrane zone. And these are made up of a whole bunch of different proteins. And the two in particular that get targeted by autoantibodies most commonly are BP230 and BP180. And these are really important structural molecules that allow these cells to construct that um, adhesive structure that allows them to adhere down to the basement membrane. So it makes sense that if you have this chain um, links in the chain that basically form these interactions between proteins, that if you lose one of those proteins through formation of an autoantibody, that that chain breaks, and then the epidermis can basically peel off of its foundation. So if we have autoantibodies that form against these basement membrane proteins, which is what happens in bullous pemphigoid, this loosens up that Velcro, and then you get a split between the epidermis and the dermis, and that's why the pathology looks like it does in, in pemphigoid. That allows fluid and other inflammatory cells to come in, which leads to the typical biopsy findings that we see here. We can localize these antibodies with direct immunofluorescence, where you can actually find those antibodies, and that's what's shown here, where we can localize the autoantibodies to the basement membrane zone, really sort of proving that these patients have um, autoreactive antibodies against the components of the basement membrane zone, which is responsible for their diseases. Um, when we're working up patients who have pemphigoid, we do a whole bunch of testing at the beginning. There are some evidence-based guidelines for screening, because often these patients need to be um, immunosuppressed to basically control this uh, autoreactive um, uh, generation of antibodies against their basement membrane zone. It's really important to screen people for all of these things. So I've discovered a, a lot of unknown cases of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and even HIV in patients who didn't know that they had them, 
Um, and it's a good thing that we did that um, before we immunosuppress them. We also check for TB and look at a bunch of other um, sort of baseline blood tests um, just to sort of get a baseline for what their level of hemoglobin is and other things that could be um, altered by some of the treatments that we use for the, this, this disorder. And then there's a nice pemphigoid antibody panel. If you practice in the community and you want to, and you have a suspicion that this might be happening, there's a nice antibody panel available from AREP, which is um, sent to the University of Utah, and that's the test number. So you can actually check for the autoreactive um, antibodies at the basement membrane zone, and then they'll actually run an ELISA against these bullous pemphigoid antigens if you ever want to order this yourself, if you're having trouble to get someone into dermatology, which I know is a common, uh, common problem. Um, so there's also a really important foundation called the IPPF, and this is a foundation that focuses on pemphigus and pemphigoid, which are both related autoimmune blistering diseases. So I think it's incredibly important that we refer patients to these types of organizations that can provide them with educational materials that are, that are geared towards patients. They often have webinars available to teach patients about their diseases, to support caretakers, et cetera. So this is a really great organization. So if you see patients that have rare diseases, I think it's very important to connect them with other patients who are going through what they're going through. And so I think that's a really valuable resource for them. Um, <clears throat> to make a diagnosis of pemphigoid, you can also identify the antibodies in the serum or through ELISA. As I mentioned, there's that antibody profile that helps us to identify these pathologic antibodies and, and to quantify them. We can also localize them on a piece of donor skin. So if we have skin that's been split with sodium chloride, we have autoantibodies that are easier deposited on the roof or the floor of the blister, and we can identify which specific targeted antigen is being marked by um, patients' autoantibodies by doing a split skin analysis that sort of allows us to determine whether the antigen is on the roof of the blister or the floor. That's pretty detailed stuff more for um, dermatologists. But, but anyway, the treatment goals in, in, uh, in this disease are really to reduce inflammation quickly. It's almost always going to require oral steroids, which is why this patient got better with uh, courses of prednisones. But um, topical steroids can actually help a lot. Um, the goal is to really stop all new blistering from occurring, and that can take take a you know a week or so. Really, once they even get on you know a half mig or a mig per uh, per kg per day of prednisone. Um, but you have to explain to patients that it's going to take time for the blisters to heal. Um, we just really want to stop any new blistering from occurring, and then long term. We want to halt the production of autoantibodies. So we do this through the addition of a steroid sparing agent, something like um, methotrexate, mycophenolate are kind of more standard um, um, immunosuppressive agents. But there are some more interesting biologic agents that are coming into this disease space that we hope will be a little more targeted than some of these um, uh, decades old uh, classic immunosuppressants. And then once we get the disease into, the, into remission with some of these other steroid sparing agents, we can often taper the, the patient off of oral steroids. Um, there are a bunch of different treatments that we use for this disease. Um, those are listed here, and I'll go through them pretty briefly. But there's a ton of uh, topical steroids, which I think always gets sort of overwhelming for people who aren't in dermatology. But we often just use um, systemic steroids in this condition if patients are really having widespread blistering. So prednisone, half a mg or a mg per kg per day in the beginning, and then tapering the dose pretty slowly, about a, five milligrams per week, and then getting them down to 10 to 15 milligrams a day so that their skin is clear and holding them at that dose until the other agents can kind of have a chance to work. A lot of patients go through this sort of yo-yo clinical course where they'll get really better because someone will put them on high dose prednisone, but then that stops and then they're back to square one, sort of covered in blisters. So we prefer to do a kind of low, uh, a long, slow taper of, of prednisone. But topicals can actually be quite effective in this disorder. So some of the class one steroids like betamethasone or clobetazole are the ones that we often reach for, but these are often limited. The insurance will often count the grams of these and will only give you sort of a travel toothpaste size tube, and that's not really going to go very far. So in dermatology, we often term, uh, turn to triamcinolone, 0.1%, ointment or cream, because you can generally get a one pound jar of that for pretty cheap. Um, and you can really apply it more generously, even though it's not quite as strong as those other steroids. This is often the one that's just more accessible and affordable for patients. There are some pretty good data. It's actually from 20 years ago now, where someone did a trial of comparing whether uh, patients with bolus pemphigoid could be treated with just topical steroids versus putting them on oral steroids. Um, and so for patients with extensive bolus pemphigoid, the topical steroids seem to be safer and were more effective actually than prednisone because it was directly you know, treating the skin. Um, and the disease you know, control was, was actually a little bit better. And the one-year survival was actually better as well. 
complications were less common in the topical group. However, this becomes really impractical to do, especially if you're dealing with an older population. People in their 80s or 90s are going to have a hard time applying this much topical steroid to their skin. It also can be very difficult to obtain this amount of topical steroid that they used in this trial. This was also done in an inpatient setting where they had nurses sort of helping to apply this level of topical steroid. So it's not really a real world trial. So most of us uh, don't really do only topical steroids, but in theory, it is possible. Um, the other treatment that we use, which is kind of weird, and we use a lot of it in dermatology and probably other specialties think we're a bit crazy for doing this, but it actually works quite well. So we use tetracycline class antibiotics um, for a lot of things in dermatology, probably more than we should, but, but in bolus pemphigoid, it actually can be a pretty um, helpful therapy. It's known to have anti-inflammatory effects because it probably reduces the action of matrix metalloproteinases um, <clears throat> that are actually partially responsible for the destruction of the basement membrane zone in this disease. So we often use doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day. And there was actually a trial done in the UK that was a pragmatic trial carried out by PCPs there actually um, to actually see if this was uh, just as effective of prednisone. So they, they tested doxycycline against, against prednisone I mean, what was called the blister trial it was published in the Lancet about uh, now six years ago. And what they saw is that, you know, disease control was 75% in the doxycycline group versus about 90% in the prednisolone group. Um, and again, adverse events were less common when you use a non-immunosuppressive treatment. So quite a significant difference there. Um, so their conclusion was that, you know, starting patients on doxycycline is non-inferior. They had a pretty wide statistical margin for considering it to be non-inferior to oral prednisone. But um, in general, if we have a patient that we really don't want to uh, immunosuppress or a patient has really labile diabetes, for example, um, we might put them on doxycycline as sort of a first uh, step approach versus trying to go directly to prednisolone. <clears throat> the other treatment you can use is something called dapsone, which is really old. Um, but it actually can be effective in this disease, especially if they have IgA deposited at the basement membrane zone. It's non-immunosuppressive, can serve as prophylaxis against pneumocystis if you have patients who are severely immunosuppressed. But it's really important to check a G6PD. I have had patients get pretty anemic on this or dyspneic from methemoglobinemia as well. So um, we don't use this too often. Um, the other more classical treatments that we use to, to spare the amount of oral steroids that we need, there isn't really great evidence for any of these, but this is sort of standard of care. And the goal is to really inhibit B and T cells that we think are at the root of this disease. So we'll use things like methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate. Azathioprine has fallen a little bit out of favor for this disease, mostly because there was a, a trial that was done that showed a little increase in hepatotoxicity in the azathioprine group compared to mycophenolate. So we more often use methotrexate or mycophenolate for these patients. Um, this is just to show that if you are using mycophenolate for other diseases, um, these are a bunch of different patients, and this is their um, basically their serum uh, level of, of how much mycophenolate they have in their bloodstream. And it, it's highly variable for patients who are on the same dose. So sometimes patients aren't getting an adequate dose, even though we're giving them the sort of normal um, oral recommended dose. Um, so that can actually correlate with their clinical response, whether they actually have a um, really proper serum level of, of these types of drugs. Um, nowadays, we use more anti-CD20 biologic therapy, so basically get rid of the um, autoreactive B cells. So if you can use an anti-CD20 um, to get rid of the B cells, you actually end up reducing all of their antibodies, but hopefully you reduce um, the pathogenic ones to stop the disease. But of course, it leads to immunosuppression as well. Um, rituximab in particular is approved for pemphigus, which is a cousin of pemphigoid. There's now a trial for, there was a trial for bolus pemphigoid. It wasn't successful. It was quite challenging to enroll older patients. You can imagine if the average age for this disease is somewhere in the 70s, that it's quite difficult to enroll patients in a trial because they often have other comorbidities. Um, there are some biosimilar antibodies now available if people have had a severe reaction to rituximab, so we're using some of those nowadays as well. Um, I'll sort of skip this for a moment. <clears throat> um, I often have patients who ask me, well, what's the best treatment? There are all these different treatments, and that really depends on a whole bunch of different factors. How severe is their disease? Do they have mucosal involvement? Do they have other risk factors or other medications that might interact with some of these um, medications? Do they have personal preferences for getting infusions versus oral meds? And are there social determinants that might limit their ability to get these therapies like insurance? Can they get to lab uh, for, uh, do they have transportation to get to labs for monitoring these? Um, do they have adverse uh, reactions to infusions, et cetera? So I often tell them it's very challenging to answer and we don't have strong unbiased clinical trial data for these rare diseases but it's likely different for these two diseases that resemble each other, both cause blistering, but we think of pemphigus and pemphigoid as being um, quite different. 
The good news is that there's increasing interest in trials for these blistering diseases. So a lot of different companies have actually gotten on board with doing some trials in this rare disease space, which is encouraging. So there are actually multiple prospective randomized studies in progress um, right now. Um, in general, my therapeutic ladder for pretty mild bolus pemphigoid is to use topical steroids. If it's a more in the kind of regular mild category, we'll add doxycycline, as I mentioned, and give them occasional slow prednisone tapers over a couple of weeks. If they're more in the moderate category, meaning they have more diffuse involvement, more actual blisters, um, we often will taper them on prednisone over, it takes two or three months to get them down. Um, if they have oral involvement, you can use dexamethasone. We might use dapsone in this case. And then in severe disease, we go with high dose prednisone tapered gradually over about six months. Sometimes a patient might need to be admitted for IV steroids. <clears throat> and then we'll also start a steroid sparing agent like methotrexate, mycophenolate. For resistant disease, as I mentioned, you can use anti-CD20 therapy with rituximab. For older patients who you really don't want to immunosuppress, you might use IVIG or dupilumab is the other one that I'm going to mention that's sort of um, potentially a bright spot in the field that might actually um, change the way we treat this disease. So in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to talk about some of the therapies in the pipeline for bolus pemphigoid. As I mentioned, this is where there's kind of some overlap with the allergy field. So pemphigus involves eosinophils that get recruited in response to the deposition of autoantibodies and secretion of certain cytokines. So there's been a, you know, an idea that, well, if we could block some of these recruitment factors for eosinophils, could we actually treat this disease with a biologic agent to allow them to preserve the basement membrane and prevent blistering? So bertolimumab, which is an anti-eotaxin-1, there was actually orphan drug designation uh, by the FDA for bolus pemphigoid. Um, the trial's actually been completed. I haven't heard any more since then. <clears throat> There's another one that blocks eotaxin-1 um, at the receptor level. This has also been a trial that's completed. And then there's an anti-IL-5, which actually reduces the number of eosinophils. This is FDA approved for asthma, and there's an ongoing trial to potentially take this medication, move it over into bolus pemphigoid. So we're kind of excited about whether targeting eosinophils through biologics uh, might actually lead to uh, effective therapies in this realm. But pemphigoid also makes people super itchy. So there are certain allergic type signals that are also involved in the pathophysiology of this disease. So IgE, we think, is involved pretty uh, significantly. It's FDA approved, as you all know, for hives and asthma. Um, there was poor enrollment in the trial for bolus pemphigoid, so it didn't get an approval. There's another trial combining it with rituximab. I don't have great hope for that one. Um, there's another different anti-IgE. There's a phase two trial, but it failed to reach its endpoint. And then the one that I'm actually most optimistic about is dupilumab or dupixent. This is an anti-IL-413 receptor antibody that's FDA approved for atopic dermatitis, asthma, and EOE. There's an ongoing trial with this for bolus pemphigoid. The results of that are still pending, but um, this is one that dermatologists are pretty comfortable using because we've all gotten um, accustomed with using it for, for uh, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So this is something that I think could really be a game changer for bolus pemphigoid because it targets what we think is a pretty important cytokine um, in the pathophysiology of this disease. Then um, the last couple, there's some overlap between pemphigoid and psoriasis. So there's certain cytokines that attract neutrophils and other cells into the skin, which is kind of what happens more in psoriasis. So could we block those um, biologic signals and help with bolus pemphigoid? So things like ustekinumab, tiltrakizumab, and ixekizumab, could those cytokines be targeted and be sort of marched over from psoriasis into the bolus pemphigoid realm? Um, we're sort of hoping that those are, are, could be used for bolus pemphigoid, but kind of waiting for the trial results from those. The last one are complement inhibitors, which are becoming more, um, um, more developed by drug companies. So part of the pathophysiology of this disease is that you have antibodies that, that deposit at the basement membrane zone. This leads to the deposition of complement, which results in inflammation and destruction of the basement membrane, which destroys the epidermal barrier. Um, could we use an inhibitor of complement to basically prevent this process and allow the basement membrane to be restored? And so there's a, a, a treatment called nemacopam, there's one called sutimlamib, and there's one called abdur abduralumab. Um, the trials here, again, um, the phase three for nemacopam was withdrawn. I'm not sure exactly why. Um, there was an anti-complement C1 antibody. The trial's been completed. I haven't heard about that. And then there's a trial ongoing for the anti-C5 um, receptor. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to thank um, my collaborators who helped me with my lab type of research. So Johan Johnson has been a collaborator at University of Michigan. The UW Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine has provided um, funds to my lab to help get us started with some pilot awards. I also have funding from the NIH to fund some of the research I talked about in the first part of this. Um, I've also been really involved in the IPPF, which is the Pemphigus and Pemphigoid Foundation. They've been really supportive of me as well, and the Dermatology Foundation helped to sort of launch my career. Um, I'd appreciate your evaluation um, on this presentation and feedback, so thanks for listening. Happy to take any questions, and then there's a word of the day I'm supposed to share at the end here, uh, which is this.
Corey, thank you very much for excellent presentation. Uh, the, the patient you showed that evolved after two years, was it clear right from the beginning that those lesions you know, were not typical urticaria, that they stayed in place uh, and hyperpigmented, that you know, right from the beginning it was clear that it was not conventional urticaria? Uh, to me, I think that you know, it's hard to know retrospectively what, what the exact history was at the first time she presented to her PCP, so I don't want to um, fault that person. But um, yeah, th those were sort of the, the signals that it probably wasn't routine urticaria. Uh, the lesions were lasting in one place for, for quite a number of days to weeks. Um, and then just the, the, the leaving behind of hyperpigmentation also is sort of a warning sign, I think, um, that the inflammation just endures longer in these lesions. It doesn't sort of come in and go out like we think of more traditional urticaria. So I think that was probably an initial sign. I just don't know how early that truly became the case if a person is covered in, in hive-like lesions, it's often difficult for them to tell you which ones have come and which one have gone and which sort of time course. So I find people often get confused about, you know, when they're covered in them. If they only have one or two spots, they can sure tell you. But if they're covered in them, oftentimes they can't necessarily know for sure. So that's when we often have them sort of draw a line with a pen around an right. urticarial plaque and say like, hey, let me know tomorrow if this is still within that boundary or not, or if it moved. So that can be a helpful tool. But yeah, she, she may have had more of an evolving disease and may have started out as routine urticaria and then sort of evolved more into bullous pemphigoid. We just don't know. But in the end, it lasted that long. It really wasn't responding to pretty high dose antihistamines and had those other features, as you mentioned. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. Do you see it? Yeah, about um, hydrochlorothiazide. Yeah. So potentially, yeah, that would be um, a good... A good sort of um, um, you know trial to do. We found that that's it's not a huge common um, inducer of bullous pemphigoid, but if there is a drug that you can take somebody off, um, that can actually prevent them from needing immunosuppressive therapy. So gliptins, as I mentioned, is a more is a pretty common one that's come up. Things like Lasix or or uh, furosemide are actually a more common inducer, but the hydrochlorothiazide is a good thought in this study. I don't believe she's on that anymore, um, but that's that's actually we think of hydrochlorothiazide as as something that we often try to get people off. There's been some, uh, and it's, it's good literature for hypertension and other sorts of things, but um, in the skin realm, there's been, it's also been linked to a higher risk of um, uh, certain types of skin cancers, non-melanoma skin cancers. There's a slightly higher risk in large scale studies. So um, if there's an alternative agent that can be used um, for blood pressure control, I think she was actually taking it because she had osteoporosis or something to increase her calcium levels. It's been a while since I've thought about renal physiology, but I, I think that might've been originally why she was on it. But, but anyway, um, yeah, it's a good thought though, because hydrochlorothiazide can induce a whole bunch of different um, uh, reactions. And she did have sort of a sulfur allergy listed, which is a good, a good pickup. Any other questions before we wrap this up? It's, it's a little past eight. Yeah, thank you all very much for uh, for listening. I appreciate the opportunity to present to a different audience. So thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you. We'll certainly have you back next year. Great. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care.